What a week. All right. Hi, how's it going? So good. It's been busy. It's been super, super busy on my end. And I know things have been really busy for you. Yeah. So hi, everybody. I'm Arizona lawyer, Julie LeBenz. Everybody knows Billy Tarasio. Um, We're so excited to be here today. We're doing this every week on Thursdays at 11, talking about different family law, legal topics, and taking your questions. Um, Yeah, things have been really busy um, all month, really. It's like the holidays ended and it was like, boom, you know, ready to go. January, January, January is a, it's a, it's a thing. It's a, it's, it's a big thing. It's a big thing for family law attorneys. A lot of people decide to file for divorce. The courts kind of slow down in December, which gives everybody, I think a little bit of a really nice break. And here we are 2023. So that's going well. Um, We've been loving our lives. Win without law school is live courses have been launched. How's that going? Yeah, we launched um, January 10th. And so the last two weeks, we've covered so much ground, um, really talking about creating a case strategy, which a lot of people don't take the time to do. They just are like, "Um, I I think I want something, but I don't know what it is. (laughs) And I'm angry. And, you know, that's kind of it. But you can take a much more strategic approach where you can figure out what your options are and then decide what you want to request and then start negotiating or, you know, start pushing that through the court. And so we've talked about that and gone through the different laws and rules to talk about, you know, what your options are for legal decision-making, parenting time, property division, spousal maintenance, um, and also post-decree. So if you already have a custody order in place, either through your divorce or through a custody establishment, but you need to make changes or enforce it. We talked about that too, about how to approach that type of situation. So um, we're getting through that. I also, this week I did a big child support um, lecture. So went through the new calculator. Last year, um, the Arizona Supreme Court put out a new calculator and it's this Excel spreadsheet. I like it. I found it really user-friendly, but You kind of need to know what you're doing with it. I I know a lot of people representing themselves fill it out the best they can, but often fill it out completely wrong. Yeah, I, I, we should go over the new guidelines and the new calculator in one of our lives. And for those of you who are just joining us, I want to let you know the format of the live. So every Thursday, Julie and I are here and we're live and we're available to answer your questions and we have a topic. So we are streaming now on our Facebook group, Decode Your Divorce, on um, YouTube and on TikTok. Let's make my computer be quiet. So today's topic that Julie and I are going to discuss is gathering evidence and then presenting evidence for your custody case. But many of you have questions and you send us those questions and we field those after we get through our topic of the day. So um, the best way to ask questions is either in the comments on TikTok or on our Facebook group in the Facebook Live. That is Decode Your Divorce Support Group. Um, I think... That's it. A couple more disclaimers. We are Arizona attorneys. The information we give you is largely around Arizona law. However, regardless of where you're at, the topics and the concepts that we're talking about are um, probably relevant to you somehow. So don't take it as gospel, but file it away and then do a little bit more research on your particular area of law. We cannot become your attorneys through the um, lovely internet at this moment in a group social media setting. So, and the advice that we're giving or the information that we're providing is limited to the fact that we're simply just discussing topics. We can't, this is not the same level of advice or when we answer your questions, it's not the same as going and seeing us for a consultation. And if you want that consultation, you can come to Modern Law in Maricopa County and in the Valley, or you can go to LeBen's Law in in the Sedona area, Mm -hmm. or you can join Win Without Law School. Win Without Law School launched, it's going really, really well. And for the next two weeks, you can get one year's access for $297. After that, price goes up. So um, I would highly recommend that you all join now. Did I miss anything, Julie? Nope, you covered it. Fantastic. So let's kick it off. How do people who are going through a custody case 
decide what evidence they should be gathering? So gathering evidence is a, kind of complicated Ugh. because you've got to think about things from a whole different perspective. It's not, you know, you're not just telling a story to a friend, you're trying to prove something in court. And so you've got to look at a lot of different things about how you're going to present this evidence. And one thing to, you know, one starting point is that your testimony is evidence. Okay. A lot of people I encounter, you know, as clients and they're like, oh, well, I, it's just me saying that. Yeah. But if you're under oath and testifying, that is evidence, but keep in mind that if it's just your words and that alone, it's not necessarily the strongest evidence. So what can you present to the court that's going to back up what you're testifying about? And in particular on the most important points. So that's one thing to consider. Secondarily, secondarily is thinking about taking something that's very voluminous and summarizing it down to a page or two for the judge. You know, if you come in with a year's worth of text messages that have been copied off and it's like 500 pages long and you're like, move to admit, exhibit one, and the judge is like, I don't have time to read through 500 pages of text messages. You're really not making an impact. But if instead you have a cover sheet where you've summarized the most important texts that prove your point, then the judge can just reference and make sure that what you're summarizing is accurate and you're good to go. And then you have more impactful evidence. So you know, thinking about how are you going to present this to the judge in a persuasive way is, is at least one consideration to go into when you're thinking about how to ga gather evidence. Totally agree. And I can't, I don't think that we can overemphasize how important it is to start with what do I want my judge to do? And what do I need to prove to make it happen? So I've been working on trial prep for a large case that I've had for a long time, and it's a relocation case. And these both of the parties kind of want to relitigate what happened in their divorce, but what happened here and what happened here and who was lying. And that's not what we have to prove. You know, what, what we want is for the judge to order no relocation keep the kids where they're at. Okay. We know what we want. Now we have to go to the statute, which tells us what we must prove in order to get the judge to do what we want. Mm -hmm. Then we choose our testimony and our evidence. So most of the things that the other side is talking about do not help win their case. And so if we get sucked into that, it's going to take away from your case instead of help you prove what you need to prove to get the judge to make the, make the decision that you need them to make. And often that means when you're testifying, you're not talking about so much like what happened. Um, it's what do I want and why? And then what happened doesn't matter. You're not asking the judge to believe he said over she said. You're saying this is the pattern. This is the this is the dynamic. This is the relationship between the child and the parent or whatever. And this is why we need you to do X, Y, or Z. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I would add to that to make sure that you're positioning your arguments in this context of the best interests of the child, because if you're wanting to rehash the past and it's going to be about this, he said, she said, or dad's bad, mom's good, or mom's bad, dad's good, you, the judge could like start snoring in the middle of your trial because the judge doesn't really care mm -hmm. about the back and forth between the parents. The judge wants to know about the kids and what's going on with them and what's best and really wants the parents to learn how to communicate better for their kids. So coming in with just, oh, mom sucks and this is why really isn't the judge is going to be like, oh, well, I've heard that a million times before. But if you can say mom sucks because this is what she does with the kid. Then the judge is like, oh, wait, so what's mom doing with the kid? What's going on? And how's this impacting the child? Then you have a better angle where you're going to get the judge's attention. So oftentimes, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, Billy, 
you get, you talk to a client and they're so intent on trying to prove the other side lied, which yeah, veracity is always at issue, but it's not necessarily relevant to deciding a parenting plan, for example. It's not. It's not one of the factors. Which parent lied is not one of the factors. So if you're going to gather all this evidence about a lie and if it's related to the child or, you know, if there is something really compelling about the lie, maybe it's worth your while. But if it isn't and it's just not that big of a deal, then you've just wasted a lot of time. So like, let's talk about decision making. Mm -hmm. Like, let's start there. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about gathering evidence on a legal decision-making contest. So if you are asking for sole decision-making or final decision-making, there's only a few ways you get there. You only get there by proving that, um, you know, one parent is an alcoholic, but even, and, and that's, that's, this is statutory. So statutorily, if you can prove that one parent has an alcohol conviction, drug or alcohol conviction within 12 months, you have a presumption in your favor. That's helpful. If you can show domestic violence, you have a presumption in your favor. That's helpful. But you really even want to take it a step further. So I think the question is always, why do you need legal decision making? Why does you having sole legal decision making help your child? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Why why is it important for me to have legal decision making? Why is it essential for me to have decision making to, to execute things in the best interest of the child? And then we have to figure out what facts exist for your children and your case that would help you explain to the judge why you need it. So what do you think? Yeah, and people think that legal decision-making covers a lot more territory than it really does. It's just these four areas, education, healthcare, religious training, and personal care decisions. And in my experience, the religious training is like a non-issue in the majority of cases, the personal Mm -hmm. care decisions get worked out one way or another. Mm -hmm. So it's really education or healthcare where Mm -hmm. there can be disputes. Mm -hmm. And so focusing down and gathering evidence about those issues. So for example, education, what's the, what's the rub here? Why do you think it's best for your child that you get to decide schooling for them and gather evidence? to that effect. So, oh, um, mom is always tardy with the kid. Mom doesn't do any homework with them. I want them to go to this private school and I'm willing to pay for it. Mom won't let them go. I want them to go to a special school that will address these special needs that they have. Dad's objecting. You know, you'll need to show why they're like what the dispute is and why you're the parent that should have the final decision or be able to make the decision and why that benefits the child. Right. So examples are they refuse to discuss issues with you. You can't exercise joint legal decision-making if they will not discuss issues with you. Or if every time you try to bring up a a major decision, you get berated. That is a great reason for you to have sole legal decision-making. Or if you disagree about some medical treatment or some educational components, and if you have a complex child. So if you have a complex child, decisions must be made. And if you have a history of an inability to work together or power struggles or one parent using the children and decision-making in an ineffective way, that's a very good reason to ask for sole decision-making. And that's the type of evidence you're going to be gathering. So those texts that are unanswered, you know, hey, um, I need this, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, You know, I I want to get little Johnny into counseling and um, the counselor needs you to sign off on the form so that Johnny can go to counseling and silence. Yeah. You know, those would be some text messages where it would be good to print those out. And when you're printing them out, if you can get it to show the date mm-hmm. or going back so that when you're printing it out, it shows the date, that's really helpful because when you go to trial and you're trying to present this text message, that's going to be one question that comes up. Well, when was this? And who is it between? Like laying all what we call foundation laying the background so that there's sufficient information to understand the exhibit and see if it should be admissible. Um, So that can be helpful in just setting up the documents. Let's also look at parenting time. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So if you are looking to present evidence about parenting time, how about putting your parenting proposal in writing? Absolutely. Making it an exhibit. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you are going to court, make your own parenting plan that you want and be prepared to testify as to why you want this particular parenting plan, why you've thought out each, each individual thing. Absolutely. 100% of the time. But before we move on to parenting time, there's something very interesting I want to discuss with you. So I'm on the family law rules committee for Arizona. So I get to see the rules that people are thinking about. And our presiding judge, Bruce Cohen, um, is putting forth a proposed order that would go to schools that would then become required for each parenting plan because schools are often in a, in a position where they're asked to interpret what does this custody order mean. And what is very interesting about the, the proposed sample orders that they're considering is they address things like registering kids for extracurricular activities. And I wonder, like, I have never, I've always been unclear. It's unclear to me if whether or not you can register a child for extracurricular activities is part of joint legal decision making. And the fact that they've included it in this order and tied in the sample order, decision making rights to the right to enroll in extracurriculars, like, what do you think about that? Yeah, usually it's been the parent, you can, one parent can sign a kid up for extracurriculars so long as it doesn't, imp you know, impede on the other parent's parenting time. So if the two parents are in agreement and it's a schedule that's going to affect both parents' parenting time, you can go forward. But if it's going to affect both parents' parenting time and you don't have an agreement, then you usually can't go forward unless you're willing to just have the kid only do the extracurricular during your time. So that's how it usually plays out. And I like that approach because it doesn't seem fair to force another parent to have to do an extracurricular. Um, but maybe that's best for the child. It, it's really a case by case analysis. I think it's a hard one because you, if you've got a, a high conflict couple situation where one parent just refuses, that can be, that is not in the best interest of the child, especially if the one parent is willing to help out with things like transportation. So it's, I think it's just a hard situation. Like you don't want to impede on somebody else's parenting time. They should be able to have their parenting time. But at the same time, you don't want your that that person's stubbornness to be able to deprive your child of the ability to do activities they want. So it, it's something that I I strongly suggest you put in your parenting plan and think about it from all angles. Maybe it's, you know, the child will do no more than one extracurricular at a time or the child will continue with the current extracurriculars and won't make any changes unless agreed to by the parents or something or a provision regarding mediation. There's a provision in Kim and Kanye West's divorce decree that is so interesting that says if they disagree, because they have joint legal, but if there's a disagreement, they agree to go to mediation. Here's where it gets interesting. If one party doesn't show up or refuses to participate, the other person gets to make the decision, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I would imagine it could get very complicated with multiple children, right. different extracurriculars, schedules, yeah. you know, weekend tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, if you just have one child and they're in one sport, it, it, there's probably no disputes at all, but multiple children, multiple sports. Yeah. You really need to get on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Not easy. I have four kids. They're of very, very different ages and it's, it's challenging. It is challenging and you really are better off coordinating, but then coordinating can lead to a lot of power struggles. So figuring out how to undo power struggles within a co-parenting relationship is just so important. Court never, ever, ever helps, but you know, such is the life we lead. So when you are determining what evidence to get, you're gonna figure out what do I want the judge to do? If you're gonna ask for custody, you know, decision-making, you wanna focus on why we can't make decisions together. If you're gonna ask for primary parenting time, now you need to figure out and focus on why the parenting plan you're asking for is in the child's best interest. How should people do that? So like we said, it's great to make an exhibit with your proposed plan. Not only is that helpful for the judge, because then the judge doesn't have to write down every mm -hmm. single thing. The judge has a document mm -hmm. that the judge can refer to after the trial. Mm -hmm. um, and then also it's a guide for you to use while you're testifying because you'll be nervous 
and may forget some things. And so it's all right there, which is really helpful. Now, if you are requesting an essentially equal plan, then you're going to meet less resistance from the judge, at least in my experience. Oh, yeah. Then the battle just may be over what type of essentially equal plan. Are you going to do every other week or 522, 322? I've heard it called both, um, which is where one parent has Monday, Tuesday, another parent has Wednesday, Thursday, and then you alternate Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every other week. So, and then there can be some other variations too. So there could be just a contested issue over what type of essentially equal plan. And if that's the case, then you really want to focus on why is your requested parenting schedule better for your children? Mm -hmm. And there is the best interest standards that you can weave in, but essentially that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if you're going for a non-essentially equal plan where you're wanting more of the time, that can be something where you're going to need to present additional evidence. Mm -hmm. Why is it best for your child? Maybe it's that it's better for your child to have consistency during the school week Mm -hmm. and not be going between houses. Mm -hmm. So what can you show in their attendance records or their school records to support this argument that consistency helps them do better? You're not necessarily going to be convincing the judge if you just say it. Mm -hmm. You'll want to have some records to back that up. Um, There may be safety concerns um, Mm -hmm. with your Mm co-parent. And so explaining what those are, maybe having some photographs that support your claims of abuse. Um, Realize that the other side could deny what you're saying. So Any additional documentation that you have that supports your position can be helpful. So the judge has something else to rely on other than just he said, she said. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, if you think you're going to have, I find that this happens a lot where parents will agree to joint legal decision making in the beginning. They don't disagree about that very often. But after a temporary basis between when the, they split up and when they're going to trial or when they're mediating their divorce, legal decision-making disputes will have occurred. One of the things that you can do is you can work into your parenting plan ways to address those issues. So if you've got kids with any complexity at all, autism or um, any type of special needs, You can work in that you'll defer to your current provider's plan or other ways to resolve a dispute. Counseling is something that parents um, often disagree about. So having a way to say, um, you know, we agree to allow counseling or um, we agree that in the event one parent thinks the child needs counseling, we will select one from the list or something to move you forward when you hit deadlock. And one of the one of the nice things is, you know, Julie and I, because we've been doing this for so long, we know what deadline what deadlock looks like and what causes it. And we can try to get in front of it. Mm -hmm. So another um, issue that can come up in a custody case is child support. So if you're in a child support battle, um, first of all, you need to put together a proposed child support worksheet. And again, this goes back to what Billy was saying, what's your requested outcome? You know, what's the number that you're asking the court to order for child support? That's where you start. And then you can work backwards. Okay, here's my worksheet supporting that number. Here's where I got my numbers for gross income for each parent. Here's the health insurance credit, Um, you know, going through each of those adjustments and then having a document to support that expense that that could even be put into one exhibit. It could all be stapled to your child proposed child support worksheet with all the support for your numbers right behind it. And then you have a document right there to testify to, Mm -hmm. but just going in and throwing a number out there is not going to work and not having solid evidence about incomes is going to leave the judge with a lot of wiggle room, a lot of discretion to figure things out. And that may or may not work in your favor. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions. Um, anything else you want to cover on how to get this exe- evidence in before we move over to our questions? Just um, the more that litigants can think about taking the issues that they're having and putting it into 
an easy to understand document can be really helpful. So um, maybe you're keeping a log of things that are going on with co-parenting issues and then typing that out and using it as an exhibit, you know, just really thinking about how to simplify things and make it easy for the judge to understand your point of view because the judge has hundreds of cases. So don't expect the judge to just get your position right away. Like you may need to have some documents and stuff to help to make your position easy to understand. So there can be a hundred things that happen over a two year period, and you're just not going to have enough time to present all of that. So identifying which things are most important and putting that together in a very um, easy to understand narrative is really important. So absolutely. It's- One of the things that we created for our clients and for people who are representing themselves is our divorce planner. And the divorce planner is so cool because you write down, where am I going to live? What's my old budget? What's my new budget going to be? What are the items of personal property they left in the house? You forget all of this. You think you're going to remember. You don't. You're not going to remember. I promise you. But you can write it down. What is the item? Who keeps it? When did we purchase it? What might it be valued at? Um, And then there's a calendar. There's parenting plan basics. It's really cool. And I think it's still available for free to download in our Facebook group. It's also available for purchase on Amazon and on Etsy. It has a journal and then has January. So a January calendar, your goals, notes, and a journal. This is so helpful when our clients do this and then they give it to us. When we need to put together what's happened and we we need to say, oh, look, you had all this parenting time you didn't use. That planner, that contemporaneous um, piece of evidence that you're creating is so, so helpful. Yeah, definitely. Or, and if you don't have the planner, write it down in a journal, write it down on a calendar. Um, the nice thing about writing it down by hand is it is less likely to look like you went back and did it. And sometimes people will say, oh, you made up this thing that you wrote on your computer. Have you run into that at all? No, I have not. No? Yeah, so <laughs> ridiculous. Um, all right, lots and lots of questions. Um, oh, the first question, are there any tools that you know about that can help be used to collect data and get it in one spot for the invited people like a lawyer or a judge to see? or maybe even service providers. So well, this yeah, is like a, a Google doc or Google sheets is I think what you're, what you're like a collaborative portal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would work. Or the notebook you were just showing too. Mm-hmm. I mean the, the, no- oops, sorry, TikTokers. <laughs> just fell down. <laughs> sorry guys. Um, the notebook is not something that is shared in real time, but normally lawyers don't need it in real time. There's not a lot of advantages to us being in the day-to-day, except for it costs a lot. (laughs) Um, But you could, we use Box at my law firm so people can upload documents and we can share documents through Box. We also use Clio. Clio has a portal and an app, or you can use something like Google Docs and Google Sheets. Um, Next question, is our family wizard more credible than text messages? Our GAL is requiring us to use OFW, but then she charges us one hour per month to review and analyze it. And then she doesn't do anything with the information. Um, I mean, the question was, is it more credible? I don't, I don't think it's any more credible than a text message. Um, the purpose of it is to manage communications in a different way that's not available via text. Um, so I don't know if, if the courts give any more weight to one or the other as far as, you know, reliability. But um, I don't know if that's really her question. You know, I know that's how she wrote it, he or she, but I don't know if that's really what the question is here. It seems more like the question is, why are we doing all of this data input and paying for it if it's not resulting in anything? So I'm using our family wizard, it's recent and it's kind of a pain. Like I don't love it, but what it does is it, it just, it makes it just a little bit more difficult to communicate. It does. So like, for instance, I took my kids to the dentist. They gave me information. I had to download it, log into our family wizard, upload it as opposed to just sending a forward. So it definitely creates a lot more steps to communication 
And so I think what it does is it places like a higher burden on notice and communication. Like you really have to go out of your way to make sure that you are getting things into our family wizard in a timely way. Um, so in some ways, I think it does like, it's easier to point out flaws or missed things because it's all in one place. Whereas our text messages are just, you know, forever and forever and forever. But if you have, if you're using our family wizard and you need to say, you know, on X, Y, Z date happened, I sent an email, nothing back. It's all in one place to show it. So um, I think it is a good litigation tool, but in terms of like somebody reviewing it and charging an hour a month, maybe you could ask them to stop. Maybe you could say, hey, could you refrain from um, reviewing this once a month and review it only before hearings or review it if we ask you to? I bet if you and your uh, the other party asked, that would be a reasonable request that they should follow. Um, does court-ordered arrears child support affect someone's ability to get a home or their credit worthiness? Um, probably, and especially if it's a judgment, an arrears judgment, that Absolutely should does. show up and yeah. could impact them. Mm -hmm. And every loan application asks you, are you obligated to pay child support? Or are you behind? So, um, I don't know that it, it affects the credit score, but the question here was credit worthiness. And I think, yes, absolutely. And then, yeah, if there's a judgment, that's even going to be worse. Can I baptize my son if I have 50-50 and his dad says, no, my daughter was baptized and dad is Catholic? No. Oh. My initial instinct would be, well, you know, the courts say do your own thing religiously during your parenting time. Um, of course, this is not just taking a child to a place of worship. It's engaging in a ceremony. Um, <laughs> so it's a tough one. And, and it's kind of like, well, if you did it, like, what would a court even do? I mean, I don't, I don't even know if there's a remedy for this one, if you were to do it. Interesting. That's kind of interesting if the dad is of the same religion that he would be objecting. So there's a, obviously there's a lot more to this story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, next question. I'm a trans man. My ex and I had a son. He's seven now. I was no legal adoption. So there was no legal adoption. Been in his life since before he was born. And now she won't let me see him. Um, so we do have a third party rights statute in Arizona, which allows for a court to award visitation based on what we call an in loco parentis relationship. So it's a Latin term, but it essentially means parent-like relationship. So if you can establish that you and the child have a parent-child relationship, even though you're not related by blood, um, the court can award you visitation. Now, these cases can be very expensive to litigate. They can take years to resolve. Um, so if you're able to open up a new line of communication with, I, I believe it was the mother, and um, try to work things out and get some time, that would be your path of least resistance. Um, and if you do initiate litigation over this to assert third-party rights, you'll write in your petition, you have to prove your parental relationship. So um, there's, there's an initial burden right off the bat to meet to show that relationship for the case to even go forward. Yeah, we used to see a lot of these cases before gay marriage was legal in Arizona. And now that um, it's legal and there's a way in Arizona to have two moms or two dads on a birth certificate, because that's relatively recent in Arizona, we see less of this. But um, you do, you have legal standing as somebody who acted as a parent, but you have to go assert those rights. Uh, just like Julie was saying, and it's not, it's not easy, but at the same time, like it's, you know, it is doable. Oh, this question says, where can I get the proposed orders for schools? I'd like to see that. You can't yet. It's not out yet, but um, uh, it is something that we discuss at the family law 
um, rules committee where we talk about the family law rules of, of procedure. And those those meetings are actually open to the public. So you could attend that way, but no way can I uh, get it a, 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 like disseminated or anything. It was just interesting to me that extracurriculars was tied to legal decision making because usually it's exactly as Julie was saying, or it's more tied to parenting time. Um, all right. Domestic violence case. I have full and sole custody. Bio dad had girlfriend take the child to a medical appointment and she made unlawful decisions. And then it says OP question mark, which I think means what are my options? Um, I'm very curious what these unauthorized medical decisions were. Um, so kind of confused actually by that and not sure if the writer's understanding of the facts is the same. I would be doubtful that a medical provider would follow a non-parent's instruction. So it sounds more like maybe it was the dad that instructed the medical provider, maybe at the request of the girlfriend or at the instruction of the girlfriend, but I don't see how the girlfriend would have any standing to make medical decisions for a non-child or for a child that is not theirs. Um, well, and appointments don't necessarily equal decisions. So my read of this most likely is girlfriend took sick kid to pediatrician, pediatrician probably prescribed antibiotics. That's, I mean, that's the only like most likely scenario I can think of. And, um, and doctors do prescribe antibiotics regardless of who took a child to an appointment. I had nannies who used to take sick kids to appointments. We, you know, and they would give them, you know, antibiotics or whatever they needed. So do you think that's an unlawful decision or a violation of mom's rights as the sole custodial parent? Um, I, I would need to know more of the situation. If this was just the kid was sick and antibiotics were given and mom, if she were in the same position, probably would have done the same thing, then I can see making it clear to the other side about how you would like this situation to unfold going forward, that you don't want it to go this way going forward and to, you know, establish some boundaries. But I'm not sure the court is really going, you know, if the kid needed antibiotics and that went that way, great. Now, if the kid has an allergy to antibiotics, like if there was some problem with the antibiotic or some, I don't know, something that made it so that wasn't best for the kid, that's a different situation. Um, but if it was like the kid got sick, he got medical treatment and got better, but you're just not happy that you weren't kept in the loop about it. It's not enough to take to court. I, I think it should be addressed with your co-parent so that you can be on the same page going forward. And if this becomes a repetitive issue that is negatively impacting the child, then you have a stronger case to take to court. Yeah, absolutely depends on what's going on. Are you obligated to have the opposing attorney choose the therapist that you go to or that the child goes to? Are you allowed to choose your own if there's no order for TI? Um, I mean, there's if there's no order about who decides, then I don't see why the opposing attorney would have some advantage or, or right to choose. But, you know, looking at it from a bigger picture perspective, there's this decision that needs to be made. It's like you're getting divorced and the house gets listed for sale. Well, you need to pick a real estate agent. You know, if the kid's going to go to counseling, you're going to have to pick a counselor. And yeah, there can be disputes about it, but ultimately it needs to get resolved and there's going to be some level of compromise. So unless there's an order naming one person to make that decision, then the two sides are going to have to work it out somehow. Yeah. Does it have to be the attorney? No. But if the opposing party won't talk to you, I think that's really evidence of an inability and unwillingness to exercise legal decision making. So you should try to work with your other parent to choose a therapist for your child. It looks like if we're talking about TI, it looks like, I don't know, either we're talking about family counseling or we're talking about the child going to counseling. And if we're talking about family counseling, that is, let's say, let's say your mom, we're talking about dad and the child going to family counseling together, but there's no TI ordered, then yeah, dad's attorney and dad are going to need to be able to have something to say about that because he's the one who's going to be going to this therapist. If we want it to work, 
we likely want somebody who is experienced with um, you know, complex child related dynamics. So anyway, the question, are you allowed to choose on your own? Probably not. If it either involves your kid and you have joint legal decision making, or if it involves your child and the other parent, you probably can't choose on your own. And often the counselor's office will want both parents to sign off. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't matter soul versus joint. Like they could have a separate office policy that wants both parents to sign. You may be able to overcome that showing an order for soul decision-making, but Mm -hmm. just keep in mind, if you go in and try to sign your kid up, you may get resistance from the counselor's office. That has nothing to do with the court. It's just their internal policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that can be a real pain (laughs) uh, for people. Does domestic abuse help in court custody cases? I have court in three weeks. It does. Um, I mean, help, you know, help what? It, you know, it depends on what your request is. If you're looking for sole legal decision-making, then yes. Like Billy referenced earlier, there's a presumption in the law that the abuser should not get joint decision-making or sole. So that can be a helpful presumption. However, that statute is very long (laughs) and there's a lot of, but ifs in it. So there can, you can show domestic violence, but if the other side is able to mitigate it and, and show, Oh, it just happened once and I've gotten counseling and we're doing good now. And, you know, then it may not be helpful. So it's really depends on your situation and how you present the case and how the other side defends themselves, but there's the legal decision-making aspect. And then there's the parenting time aspect. So there's some presumptions for legal decision-making if domestic violence is is involved, but then also parenting time with the gist being that parenting time won't necessarily be cut off, but the court is supposed to look to what parameters can we put on the parenting time to ensure the child's safe. So no overnights, supervised, you know, things like that or limited time, the court may do. In my experience, the courts prefer contact versus no contact. It's yeah. almost like they're, they think that it's better for a kid to know than to be just in the dark about what one of their parents is like. So even if that one parent isn't ideal or things aren't great, in my experience, the court is like, it doesn't matter. We want the kid to know this parent, even if they aren't great versus having no contact at all. And so even with a, a drug abuser, an alcoholic, a domestic violence um, convict, you know, you're looking at likely some sort of parenting time and you're going to be fighting over what those restrictions are. Right. Right. There is a, a, the domestic violence statute long it's 25403.03 and um it says specifically in there that that all the different ways that parenting time might be appropriate with a abuser that you might be able to mitigate the dangers one of that those ways is supervised parenting time it goes on to say what the restrictions of supervision would be what the obligations of the supervisor would be. And I rarely find that those get incorporated into orders. But if you're going to court in three weeks and supervises parenting time is one of the things that you're um, looking to get, even regardless, because you're going to court in three weeks and you have domestic violence issues and charges, please read 2540303. And please think about what you want to ask and tie it to that statute and remind the judge of that statute because I see, in my opinion, I see judges get this wrong. I see judges order a lot of unrestricted parenting time, even when there's proven domestic violence between the parties. And it it breaks my heart and it's not always safe. So definitely check that statute out. And I also wanted to mention, if you're requesting supervised parenting time, keep in mind that you need to have a full proposal. Yeah. You're not just like court, I want it supervised. And the court has like a whole room full of supervisors that are ready to just come into your life and, and manage the parenting time. Right. That does not exist. Instead, you need to propose who the supervisor is going to be mm-hmm. and make sure that person's on board for it and have that all worked out. And what you may find is that there is nobody to do the supervising. 
Right. You can or, pay companies mm-hmm. to do it. It's very expensive. So if it you is. can't afford that, then you're like, okay, do I trust grandma? Do I trust grandpa? Do I trust new girlfriend or boyfriend? Is there some other aunt or uncle? You know, you're 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 looking at all these people to bring in, but they're likely people who are family members of the person you're wanting supervised, and you may or may not trust them to do the supervising. So this concept of supervised parenting time, although it can be a great solution, it's sometimes really difficult to get put into place. And if alcohol is involved, if alcohol is involved and they're only abusive when they're drunk, which I have had come up in a number of cases, Soberlink is an incredibly effective tool to monitor your the soberness of your other parent and therefore keep your child safe while still allowing regular parenting time. I am a huge, huge fan of Soberlink. So for, yeah. So for those of you that don't know what Soberlink is, is it's a breathalyzer. And when you blow into it, the data gets transmitted to the cloud and is kept track of and shared. So you can request that language be put in your court order that your co-parent has to blow into the Soberlink breathalyzer at the outset of parenting time. And then again, at the end, so you can confirm that during that parenting time, they were sober. Right. And, and if it's a really long time, you could ask for them to test during it as well. I mean, you could say every two hours test or whatever. Right. Um, and so that would be, you know, when Billy talks about what is your requested outcome, that's something to look at. Okay. I am requesting Soberlink. I want it every two hours. I want the, I want my co-parent to pay for Soberlink. You know, all of those terms mm-hmm. are, are what you're going to want to talk to the judge about. Mm-hmm. And you may even want to offer to pay for Soberlink. It is cheaper than supervised parenting time. It is cheaper than, you know, the child care. And I've seen kids be able to establish, you know, healthier relationships with mm-hmm. abusive parents. So I, I am, I'm a big, big believer that this, if keeping your parents sober allows for parenting time, absolutely do it. I wish there was something like this for, um, for drugs, um, or other abusive people who are not using alcohol, but it's come up enough times so that I'm, I'm just a real, real proponent of it as a, a a viable option, um, to allow parenting time it's more long-term than supervised parenting time. Like Julie was saying, actually following through with supervision, finding people to do it, making sure they're actually doing it right. Making sure that they're, you know, that they're there is really, really hard. It's not a great long-term outcome in my opinion. Sometimes it's the best you can do, but it's, it, there are challenges with it. If the other person does not turn in the paperwork that the judge has asked for, does the divorce get put on hold? So it really depends. Sometimes that situation can cause a delay if there's compelling reasons why um, they didn't get their paperwork in, or sometimes even if there's not a compelling reason, but there's some document that the judge really wants to see that that person needs to produce. The judge may delay because the judge wants to see that particular evidence. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, the judge will say, you missed the deadline. Well, too bad. And we're just going to fill in the blanks based on whatever evidence is presented. So I would say most often it will be the we're going forward. You missed your deadline. Too bad. But I don't want you to think that that happens every time because I've gone into hearings and been like, oh, this is going forward no matter what. And the other side missed their deadline. And, you know, they're going to have to suffer the consequences. And then we get to court and the judge is like, well, actually, I da 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 da. And it's super frustrating. So there is no clear cut black and white answer. It really just depends on your judge and your situation. Absolutely. Um. So many good questions here and not that much time. Here's a a one that I really want to address. When can I present evidence to the judge as I don't want the other party to see it first? 
So um, it doesn't work that way. It used to. Um, prior to this judge named Judge Zalakit creating new rules, there used to be a lot of surprise at trial. Mm -hmm. And eventually the court said, this is just not efficient. And so in came what were called the Zalakit rules, which required each side to show their cards. You have to show everything that you're going to present prior to the trial, all your, your list of witnesses, a summary of what they're going to talk about, all of your exhibits, and often too, you know, your, your theories. Um, that's not always explicitly laid out in Rule 49. It is in Rule 26 of the civil rules. But I think that there is um, an argument to be made that those theories should be sh shared as well. And so now you're supposed to supposed to share all of that. And we're not supposed to have what's called trial by ambush. Um, the only time that you can talk to the judge without the other side being there is at what we call an ex parte hearing, which you can get on an emergency basis or through an order of protection. However, that amount of time you have that is ex parte is limited because the court always allows for due process, which means there's going to be what's called a return hearing a follow-up hearing where the court will hear from both sides. If you're in the emergency temporary order context, that return hearing gets set automatically. If you get an ex parte order protection, the other side can request a hearing and then get their due process. So there are some limited ways to talk to the judge, but it's not necessarily going to be like that forever. The judge will get an opportunity to hear from the other side. And yeah, that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> okay. Um, what happens if a party refuses to pay the child custody fee given by the judge? Um, well, the judge, I would bring that to the court's attention. I'm sure that the um, provider who's wanting their money, they're likely going to bring that to the judge's attention. Often what happens is the provider won't perform the work until they get the full money. And so it creates a delay and it comes to the judge's attention that way. And then the judge will see what they can do to remedy the problem. Um, are there marital assets if this is a divorce that the court could make certain orders about to get the money to pay? Um, is the court possibly going to order the other side to pay just to get this done with an equalization to be happened you know, down the road? Um, I, I don't know, but essentially the judge is going to look at the situation and likely impose some sort of sanctions on the party that's causing the delay. One interesting thing this brings up is, um, the courts will often order parties to do something, a comprehensive family assessment, um, marital counseling, uh, uh, a CAA or a court appointed advisor. And there is case law regarding, you know, what happens if you don't do it? Um, the fact that you don't do it in and of itself cannot be a reason that you lose parenting time or lose custody. The judge has to make an order about what's in the best interest of the children. And you're allowed to present that evidence, even if you refuse to comply with these third-party providers. Now, I have never had that situation play out in one of my cases. Have you? No. And, you know, even though you have those rights and you can push that forward, what do you think the judge is going to be thinking? Oh, yeah. I mean, the reason the case law exists is because the judge was like, uh, no, <laughs> you're losing your kids. And that's the only reason we have the court of appeals case that says, no judge, you can't do that. You can't, you can't, you can't get angry at the parent and then take away their children as a remedy for your anger or them not listening to you. So it's an interesting issue of rights, you know, because parties can be ordered to do things by judges that they don't want to do. And you've got to figure out how you want to handle that situation. You can settle. That's your best way out. Your best way out is figuring something you can live with between you and the other party. And that's the risk of getting the court involved. Yeah. You yeah. may not be happy with the outcome. Mm -hmm. You may have all these other people ordered to now investigate your life and render a, an opinion about you as, an, as a parent 
Mm-hmm. And that that's very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked, what's the case law? There's multiple cases on this. Hayes v. Gama is the kind of quintessential case on the topic in Arizona. And it stands for the, um, the principle that all evidence related to the best interest of the child is admissible. So that's the only type of evidence that you might be able to sneak in if you haven't disclosed. If you have evidence related to the best interest of the child, the court is supposed to consider it regardless of disclosure, regardless of whether or not you did what the court wanted on X, Y, Z, other issues, they're supposed to consider it. Um, Somebody said, you mentioned rules 49 and 26. Where do we find these rules? Um, So 49 is from the Arizona Rules of Family Law Procedure. 26 is Arizona Rules of Civil Procedure, which I was just referencing that. You really don't need to look that up if you have a family law case. But um, if you go online and you do a search for Arizona Rules of Family Law Procedure, you'll see a link that has Westlaw in and click on that and that'll take you to all of the current rules. Okay, let's see. We've just got a few minutes left. Let's do one question and then I want to make sure that everybody knows about when without law school. Um, any tips on common deadlocks for decision making and some ways to get around the deadlocks? Yeah. Um, so number one is to not get discouraged. Like this is, this is part of the path, you know, this is co-parenting. This is working things out. I think that, you know, people hear the word amicable and they think that means that everything is just butterflies and roses and simple. But even if you're amicable, you're still negotiating. You still don't agree from the first moment, but you're willing to figure it out. And so that's where you're looking to go is, okay, we're in this place of deadlock, but I want to check in. Are we both dedicated to resolving this outside of court? Because if we are, then let's sit down and figure this out. How can we be flexible? What is the true area of contention? And can we narrow down to that one issue? And now what's the compromise? Because anytime you're reaching agreement, there's some sort of compromise. So can you give up something here to reach an agreement there? Um, Is it something where maybe you agree to try out a certain thing for six months and then revisit it? Um, Obviously, I don't know the exact details of your deadlock, but I would say don't give up is one of the most important things. That's a great tip. The other thing you can do is you can agree to a procedure to resolve the deadlock. Oh, right. So depending on, you know, what type of deadlock you anticipate, you can come up with a procedure that says in the event we have a disagreement in the, in these categories, this is how we'll handle it. First, we'll sit down and discuss it. If we still don't agree, then one party can go get a third party opinion, share the results, discuss it then. If that doesn't work, the other person can go get a second opinion or something like that. Um, some procedure for decision-making can help. Um, All right, we're almost out of time. Win Without Law School, it is alive and well, it's going. Which courses are already recorded and people can get access right now? So um, the order protection course is in there. And then the first couple of weeks of the classes are in there. And then we're just always adding more stuff. Um, The child support class I did this week was really comprehensive. Um, We've gone through parenting plans, property divisions, spousal maintenance, just a lot of different issues. And now um, over the next few weeks, it's going to get into, okay, initiating your case, um, service. um, And also, even before we get to that part of filing the case, we are talking about how to try to work things out before you even file. And how to open that dialogue and start um, negotiating because in Arizona, we have two processes that simplify getting divorced or changing child support. And it's these simplified procedures that have been opened up. So we have this new simplified consent decree option for divorce where 
If you can reach an agreement before you file, your filing fees are less. It, it moves forward really smoothly if that is a good fit for you. And then for child support, there's this simplified child support procedure you can do as well just to get things moving really fast. So we're going to go over that as well. We look at both ways to resolve things quickly as well as if you're caught up in a contested matter, we cover all of it. So winwithoutlawschool.com, um, go there, sign up for the email list. And, um, you know, from there, you'll start getting a bunch of different information. Yeah. I mean, we also have the trial skills course. That's a 10 part course that will help you navigate the courtroom. We've got a parenting plan course, We've got the procedure. It's really pretty built out. There's a lot of great information and more is being added all the time. From now until the end of January, you can get one year's access, including the live Q&As with Julie for $297. So head over there, register. And I think we have it uh, broken up now so that you can buy smaller parts or the whole thing. So really great resource. Definitely check it out. Thank you, Julie. And we'll see you next week. All right. Bye, Bailey.